Welcome into the Cowboys Report. I am Tom Downey. Here's what's coming up on today's show. We've got the latest on Tyron Smith and when his potential return from injury could occur. A James Washington update, since so many of you are curious there. We'll talk to Tony Pollard versus Zeke debate, drama, conversation. Tristan Hill being gone, a potential running back the Cowboys could sign. And whether or not at the very end of the show, if that Brandon Cook's dream is dead or not. We'll break that all down beginning with Tyron Smith. Stephen Jones says that Tyron Smith is roughly three to four weeks away from returning to practice. The Cowboys would then have a 21-day window where once he's doesn't need to return and practicing to be activated to the full game day roster, 53-man roster, I would assume they would use up as much of that time as possible to get Tyron fully into game shape up to speed there. In theory, that would put a potential return, to return timeline somewhere in December. So he's not going to be good to go week 9, obviously. Week 10, he's out. Week 11, I'd say you feel comfortable saying week 12 against the Giants, he's not back. Potentially then week 13, week 14, maybe into week Week 15, he's getting practice reps. And week 15, week 16, somewhere in that range, maybe then Tyron Smith could return to the game day roster and then be active. And I would assume find a, star, a spot in the starting lineup for him. That's the next part of the conversation. If and when Tyron Smith gets healthy, was a future Tom problem, but we'll have the conversation for now and then refer to it in the future. What do you do along the offensive line? Tyron Smith has not played anywhere other than left tackle in a decade. Given his age and his injury history, you probably don't want to have him shuffle around. That's going to lead to more problems. But also, Tyler Smith is your left tackle of the future. Do you want to potentially stunt his growth? My answer is, I'm not sold on that because you're right. You don't want to risk the growth. But you're also going to be a playoff contender come December. You're 6-2. and two. You'll probably have no more than 4 or 5 losses by then if everything goes according to plan. And you're going to be fighting for a playoff spot and seeding and to make that run we've been waiting for for years. You want to get your best five out there. I feel confident saying your best five include both Smiths. Tyron at left tackle, Tyler at left guard. If you want to have the McGovern Biotis debate at center, cool. But look at their numbers. It's not that Tyler Smith has been a disaster. It's not. It's that he's right now is not as good as what Tyron Smith was last year, even including the bad playoff game. In fewer snaps by over 300, Tyler Smith has allowed already more sacks. The hurries are the same. He's allowed only uh, two fewer hits, so the pressures overall are almost identical. The penalties are almost the same. Both players had two declined. Tyler Smith, by the way, I feel like he just gets a pass because he's the young first-round pick, and that's fine. But Tyler Smith is a bit of a penalty boy right now. You got to get that figured out, but we knew that going in, so expectations matter. I'm not mad at Tyler Smith. I've been quite pleased with the way he's played. I think the PFF run grade for Smith is way too low, by the way. I think that's disrespectfully low, but Tyron's better. So I think if and when Tyron Smith is healthy, yeah, he starts at left tackle. If he gets hurt again, you just go back to Tyler at, at left tackle and McGovern at left guard. But that's my opinion. I want to hear from you guys. Should Tyron Smith start at left tackle once he's healthy? Why for yes and for no? Sound off in the comments at the pinned comment. So if the ad break comes on YouTube, take advantage, head down there, and let me know. From one injured player to another, James Washington. He has not had his activation window opened, meaning... Whenever they Disney him to return, he's got 21 days to practice. He's close, closer, soon is what we keep hearing, which is an update, but also not much of an update. I wonder if maybe after the bye week, the Cowboys could open up his return window. He's got the foot injury, and foot injuries for receivers can be a bit, a bit, can be a bit dicey. I mean, I'm looking at Rashad Bateman and Michael Thomas going on IR today. Neither guy's been healthy as they've battled foot issues, for, at least in Thomas's case, for a while. I also make this note. Uh, especially in light of not getting Brandon Cooks. If we're banking on James Washington to fix, improve, save the receiving room, we're going to be disappointed. He hasn't done anything. And there's a reason why he signed for basically the vet minimum with Dallas. There was not very much interest in James Washington. Now, he flashed a bit in 2019, but he kept falling out of favor in, in Pittsburgh. He just wasn't producing, even if there are valid concerns about what the quarterback situation was. Again, the, 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 the same philosophy is we're going to have the quarterback save everything then if we're banking on Washington. He's not better than Noah Brown, not better than Gallup or CeeDee Lamb. Now, he's probably better than Kevontae Turp or than Jalen Tolbert. He's been a huge, 
huge disappointment. We'll talk about Turpin later on this week. But Washington does not, does not fix your situation when it comes to the wide receiver room, so please keep that in mind. Today's Cowboys report made possible by established titles. If you don't know what that is, allow me to explain. I am now Lord Tom Downey, which my wife sometimes doesn't like when I make her call me that, but it's funny anyway. It's the perfect novelty gift this for last-minute holiday shopping. Fun, unique way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland helping global reforestation efforts in the process. You get a square foot of land on a private estate in Scotland. By the way, you can all have the little same chat sports areas if you use our code chat at establishedtitles.com slash chat. We'll all be by each other in the chat sports kingdom. It's based on the old Scottish custom where landowners are referred to lords or Ladies, you get a square foot of land. They plant a tree uh, with the help of global charity partners. One tree planted and trees for the future. Then you get the certificate stating you're a landowner in Scotland. You can go by lord or lady on ah, your credit card, your plane ticket, maybe your dating profile. To Maybe you get more swipe rights. Maybe you get bumped up if there's an opening in first class because they see lord on there, right? 10% off when you use promo code CHAT over at establishedtitles.com slash chat. It's the perfect last-minute holiday gift. That link, by the way, is in the comments section and in the description. Let's talk now about Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard. The debate that always continues, depending on who's playing better, is who ends up winning. And it never stops because we can never have nice things as Cowboys fans. Let's begin with what Jerry Jones said after Tony Pollard went off against the Chicago Bears. There's no argument. Zeke's ability to punish ability to, to deliver, Zeke's ability, what he does for us in pass protection, and frankly, Zeke's ability is to make big plays are there, and we're going to go as Zeke goes. I really mean he's that integral to our success this year. I'm fine with Jerry back and his player, etc. I want to make this clear. The offense is not built upon Zeke. That's not accurate. It is 2022. Outside of like the Titans, there aren't, and maybe the Colts, there aren't offenses that are built on only the, the back's ability. And you don't want that offense, by the way. Shouldn't be lost on you that you had 49 points scored in a game that Zeke did not play. This is not anti-Zeke, by the way. I want to make that clear. But Zeke is not the straw that stirs the drink anymore. That's not how the offense is built. That's not how it does it at its best. Now, if you want to make Zeke your closer, like I've advocated, advocated for years now, I'm all for that. But he is not the engine that drives your offense. That, in the end, is still your passing game. Or, in general, your explosive plays. That's what teams covered in the modern-day NFL. And the explosive play aspect is what Tony Pollard brings in spades. Now, the, the new anti-Pollard argument, or why Pollard can't be your number one overwhelming back, is the, not, not the health, but the stamp. Stamina. Here's what Skip Pete, the running backs coach, said. Pollard played a total of 30 plays. I think that's his max as far as total play count because then the juice doesn't become the same and he's not as quick, not as fast. We got that long run on third and one. So he got the sign and said, Coach, I'm done. Done for the game. I've got no more. Look, Pollard looked tired on that run. He also scored a touchdown run on it. So I don't know why we're acting like only Pollard gets tired when I've seen Zeke get tired in games too, by the way, and struggled a bit last year because he wasn't 100%. This is not a only use Zeke, only use Pollard debate. It's let's look at the totality here and figure out who should get 51%. If we want to go game by game, that's fine. Who wins the tiebreaker? Here are the numbers. The raw stats to begin. Similar snap counts now because Zeke did not play last week. On fewer carries, Tony Pollard has more yards. That feels very significant because every year the argument is, well, Pollard isn't ready. Pollard's not good enough. Pollard can't handle the workload. The efficiency is going to drop. Hell, I said the efficiency was going to drop. Tony Pollard, in a career workload year, is having a career efficiency season. Every time we say, oh, he can't take more, he takes more of the load and does even more with it. How about the advanced numbers here? I see the arguments of, well, Zeke is a better pass protector, which is true, by the way. Uh, Zeke has done a much better job in pass protection. The, that bottom stat there, pressure rate allowed, very much favors Elliott, although it's not like Pollard's terrible. Also, that is literally 10% of the snaps. If we're making our decision on who should be the overwhelming number one back or just get the majority based on 10% of the snaps, I ain't going to make a mistake there because the pass blocking is the least important part of your running back's job. It is running the football catching passes, and then it's pass protecting, to be clear. But as weird as this sounds, and we'll spend some time on this, I know it's a unique stat, 
Tony Pollard has faced more 8-plus defenders in the box this year than Ezekiel Elliott. 27.2 versus 19.3 per next-gen stats. Rushing yards over-expected based on what's blocked for you. This, again, is kind of a big play stat from next-gen stats. Tony Pollard, uh, 2.37 over. That leads the NFL. Elliott, minus 0.28. Expected points added. This is for uh, uh, per Ben Baldwin, i.e. How, how much do you impact the drive and going to score there? Tony Pollard, 0.22, a massive high figure for a back, by the way, because that stat favors passing games. Elliott, minus 0.58, still about average there. Success rate, which is which kind of ties into your, hey, it's third and short. Can you get the first down? Uh, it's Tony Pollard, barely over Zeke. They've both been really good in that stat, by the way. What I'm saying is not, oh, you can't play Zeke anymore. Pollard's got to get 80%. That's ludicrous. Right now, it's about a 60-40 Zeke to Tony Pollard split. Why don't we try 55-45 for a little bit with Zeke? See if Pollard can handle that workload. The Cowboys keep saying Pollard can't handle it, but they've never really given him the full workload, and every time that they give him a little bit more, there's no drop in the efficiency. So pick a running back. 51% is the way I would approach this here, even just relative to what it is now. EE -E for Ezekiel Elliott or TP for Tony Pollard. To be clear again, the Cowboys can should and will continue to use both. I don't want this twisted into a, ah, see, you hate Zeke. Ah, see, you hate Pollard and this whole uh, straw man argument of, ah, you got to tear down the other. No, you can use them both. But I crave the explosive plays in the modern day NFL because that is how you have successful drives as opposed to really trying to convert a ton of third downs and that's how drives can stall out. Explosive plays are valuable. And, oh, one more stat for you, by the way. The explosive play rate for, for ground carries, which is only 10 yards or more. Ezekiel Elliott, 12.5%. Tony Pollard, 21.6. You want to expand to big, big, big explosive plays, 20-plus yards on the ground. Ezekiel Elliott, since 2019, 2.25. Tony Pollard, 8.5. In terms of what gives you more on the ground, it is unquestionably Tony Pollard. Now, if you're a diehard Cowboys fan, hit that big red button and subscribe. Free Cowboys videos every single day when you sub. It's the red button, or if you're on the new version of YouTube, the black and white button. So don't miss out. Subscribe right now. Some minor news and notes here. Then we'll talk about Brandon Cooks, as I promised. Tristan Hill is gone. He is no longer a member of the Dallas Cowboys. The Arizona Cardinals have claimed Hill off of waivers following his release by the Cowboys. I don't know if anyone else put in, put in a waiver claim. Arizona's kind of near the middle, so I wouldn't be that surprised. But give me your one-word reaction to Tristan Hill being claimed off of waivers. Sound off for me right now in the comments section. My one word is bye, or I forget what the movie is, but it's, well, bye. Okay. Uh, it's disappointing. It, he is a bust, unfortunately, for the Cowboys. We can go back and look at my reaction to the, that pick. I was not happy about it. But I'm not upset about Tristan Hill being gone. Someone told me he was the Cowboys' second best defensive tackle. I couldn't agree more, or couldn't disagree more. In 25 career games, Tristan Hill has 33 tackles, four TFLs, and half a sack. That is it. That, 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 that is not production worth being upset about. Just because he gets a splash play every third game, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. If he has success in Arizona, cool. It was never going to happen here in Dallas. Another news item on Dexter Williams. He worked out for the Cowboys per Aaron Wilson, which I find interesting. Potential practice squad shuffling here. He's not going to be signed to the game day roster. Zeke Pollard Malik Davis have been on the game day roster for the Cowboys with Rico Dowdle now, now on IR. Quadri Olison is the practice squad. Could also just be a case of the Cowboys doing their due diligence to look into other options if there are more injuries. Don't think signing is going to happen anytime soon. If it is, it's practice squad. All right, finally, as promised, Brandon Cooks. Uh, I've seen the social media conversation about, hey, the Cowboys could get him, the Texans might cut him. Pump the brakes here. Brandon Cooks is unhappy he wasn't dealt. I think it's twofold. One, he didn't want to be shopped, and then when he was being shopped, he was mad it didn't go down when they told him. I, I think what happened here is the Cowboys thought they were super close. I think Brandon Cooks thought he was super close to being dealt. And he was like, I didn't want to be traded. That's why I signed the extension. Now you're shopping me. Just get me out of here. And, and he's unhappy. Now, there's a lot going on here. He's not playing Thursday Night Football because he's unhappy. And he's, he's not, it's not the wrist. He's just mad. 
Cooks would be subject to waivers if cut. All players after the trade deadline are subject to that. He is a fully guaranteed $18 million salary next year. If a team claims him, they assume that contract. Now, a team like the Bears, for example, should be all over that. Add the receiving talent. You got the cap space for it next year. If he doesn't get claimed on waivers, the Texans owe that money. Now, there might be some offset language, but probably not that much. And the Texans cannot afford to cut Cooks and have him go unclaimed. They lose $17 million in cap space, and they have like four available. They can't afford to make that happen. So unless Cooks agrees to waive money, which seems unlikely for him, or the Texans say, screw it, we know he'll get claimed, they do some back you know, communication stuff, I don't think he's going to get cut. And by the way, waiver wire, based on current NFL standings, the reverse of it, so i.e. draft order, Cowboys near the end. Don't get your hopes up. 